Okay, you're on. I'm sorry. Uh, I I forgot to turn on the m m turn on my mic. Now, can everybody hear me? Oh, okay, that's great. So, good morning, everybody. Today we are uh, talking about uh, the general guidelines for posology, or what we call in general as dosage. So this is one of the very, very important um, concepts we should know because uh, the dose, it's a very, very important or the key factor which influences the efficacy of a medicine. Uh, so we are going to look at the general guidelines of the dosages of the Ayurvedic formulations, what they have given in the text, and we'll discuss a little more on that concept because the texts are were written um, maybe 5,000 years ago, the Ayurveda, the constitution of the, what we can we say, the uh, physical uh, appearance or the strength, etc. of the persons uh, changed from that period to now. In the text itself, they specifically say uh, in the Kali, whether it's in the coming years, the person's ability to which time the medicine might decrease, and so we have to alter the dose by using our intelligence, what they call yukti pramana. So here, in first we discuss the general guidelines given by the Ayurvedic test, and then we'll see how we should adopt that to the uh, current uh, era. So moving on to the objectives of today's study. We are studying, or we are uh, studying the qualities of an ideal beshaja. What are the properties of a medicine to call it to be ideal? To review the general steps involved in the beshaja kalpana. This already we have uh, looked in the previous classes, but uh, here we are just reviewing the general steps involved in the beshaja kalpana. The main objective of Today's class is to study the general guidelines of pulsology or dosage for various Ayurvedic formulations and also to study the specific times for administration of Ayurvedic herbs and formulations. So we'll look into each of these objectives in detail. So I'll come back to this slide later. First, we'll see the slide number four. It's about the Bheshaja. So what does a Bheshaja mean? The, by definition, it says that the Bhesham Roga Bhayam Jayati Iti Bheshajam. That means that which, has, which helps to overcome the fear of illness is called Bheshaja. Or we can say the Bheshajas are the Dravyas used to heal. These dravyas can be of plant origin, maybe herbs, something like that, or they can be of animal origin or mineral-based, as we studied in our previous class of dravya classification. In general, all the dravyas which are used to heal, which helps us to overcome the illness, which helps us to conquer the diseases, are called as beshajas. These beshajas or the dravyas can be used individually or they can be used in combination. When they are used individually, that part, it's called a Kamulika Prayoga. I'm going to type here. Oh, maybe I change the color. A Kamulika Prayoga. So Eka is the single. And mulika is the dravya or the herb, and prayoga is the use. So when the drugs, it's one very important concept used in Ayurveda, where a single herb is used to heal. So when a single herb is 
used it's called ekamulika prayoga or the dravyas can also be used in combinations so when combination of dravyas are used to make formulations they are called the kalpas so the ayurvedic preparations it might be a kashaya or gulika or lesha or swarasa etc they are called as the kalpas the study of ayurvedic formulations is called the peshija kalpana so when we use an individual drug it is called ekamulika prayoga or when we used a combination of um, bheshaja or combination of dravyas to make different formulations they are called as the kalpas the study of the various formulations is that branch is called as bheshaja kalpana so the general steps involved in bheshaja kalpana so bheshaja kalpana i said it's a preparation of formulations so from where we have to start and where we have to end so these are the steps involved the first step involved in the bheshaja kalpana is the preparation of medicine is to collect the dravyas collect the uh, materials required for the preparation so this is usually done basically with the nama rupa vijnana in olden days nama rupa vijnana is the knowing their name their morphological features by knowing the morphological features and the details of the dravyas so in olden days the ayurvedic scholars and the ayurvedic practitioners they used to collect the dravyas required for the preparations by themselves they never relate on any other second persons so they used to go and collect their own herbs and many many informations were given regarding the collection of dravyas like when to collect a dravya when to collect a different part of dravya so suppose we are using a leaf for a preparation so when to collect the leaf they say it's just in the autumn just before the leaf is about to fall that is when the leaf is all mature and it contains all of its potency so similarly depending on the part used they say when which time of the year is good to collect them and also they say some other specifications like collecting the particular dravya on a particular star day based on the astrology that we call as a uh, tithi nakshatra etc so they decide uh, which drug should be collected on which nakshatra or tithi something like that and um, they follow a specific procedure to collect it so they wake up in the early morning they take bath and clean, clean themselves and uh, Uh, perform some puja or vedic ceremony like that then they go identify the drugs and um, then they uh, before they collect it before they pluck it or uproot the um, plant they offer puja that's vedic ceremony for the plant and to the even to the earth and they pray that oh lord i'm collecting this dravya for saving someone's life and uh, Uh, or to um, help someone who is in pain so please uh, empower this plant with all its potency and may it help to okay may it help to heal the pains of the other person so like that they used to pray the god and they used to collect it so the importance of collecting the dravya by the ayurvedic practitioner itself i think it's it's very very important so i'll just give a small example which happened in my town so one of our family friend he had a back ache and uh, as most of you know in india the ayurveda it's like the household medicine uh, most of our grandmas they know some of the herbal medicine or herbal remedies for such kind of common uh, condition so one of uh, their friend they advised this person who is having back ache to take a decoction of uh, uh, castor a decoction made up of root of castor so this person asked one of his servant that do you know the castor plant and the servant said s yes. so the master said to the servant okay go and collect some castor roots for me and the servant went and he got some roots uh in general when he looked into the okay this is the same plan the master he cut the roots and he boiled it and make it made a decoction and drank it 
within 15 minutes or half an hour, the person who drank the decoction started acting weirdly. He started delirium, uh, agitated, he became violent, and uh, uh, his vitals like BP started fluctuating, the, he developed tachycardia, etc. Immediately the person was hospitalized. There they performed all types of tests, but they couldn't find the reason. Then ultimately, when it, before it's too late, the doctors realized to ask the history with the patient, and they asked, what did he take? Did he eat or drink something different today than he usually does? Then they said, okay, yeah, he drank this kashaya or the decoction for so and so complaints of backache and all. Then they asked what the kashaya, the decoction was made of. They said the castor roots. And the doctor said, can we get a sample of those? And can we, can you go back to the home and see, like bring her whole lot? So when the patient's party, they went back to home and bring, bring the whole, brought the whole bulk of the roots, the doctors identified there is one branch or one plant that is called Dathura. That's the um, Dathura metal or Dathura strimonium or Dathura ferrous. So it's, it's a plant. Uh, it's also used in Ayurveda, but it's toxic. So before we use it, it needs to be purified. So along with the castor roots, the patient was a little bit negligent and he, he was not paying the attention. So he picked the castor roots, but along with that, he brought a datura plant. So that plant, uh, the master didn't check it thoroughly. He just relayed on the servant and he cut and made a decoction and he drank it. So the, that datura contains the atropine and some other tropine alkaloids. So it highly it's toxic. So depending on the variety, whether it's a stramonium or the ferrous or the the thura metal, so uh, the toxicity varies. But but all of them are having the toxic effect. So because of the atropine, his BP started varying. That he developed tachycardia and all. And by its um, effect on the CNS, the patient started delirium, etc. Then they realized that was the case immediately. They gave him some gastric lavage, other things, and um, they were able to uh, save the patient. So that is the reason why in the in olden days the Ayurvedic physicians were not uh, relying on anybody. They used to go by themselves and collect the drug. But um, nowadays, I don't think it's uh, possible in each and every case, but we have to rely on the pharmacies, what supplies the medicines to Ayurvedic medicines to us nowadays. But still, it is a good thing to uh, research thoroughly about the authenticity or the uh, authenticity of the pharmacy from where we are getting the medication. So that is a very important step, the collection of the dravyas. The second step involved is the purification. So the, after collecting the dravyas may have many physical impurities as well as the chemical impurities. So they should be purified to take out the physical impurities like sand, mud, or any dirt, etc. It can be washed or thoroughly sieved with a siever, etc. to take the physical impurities. To take the chemical impurities, there are various procedures told in Ayurveda specific to each drug. Um, it can be macerating, it's a, a macerating the drug, um, drug with a Specific uh, swarasa, which nullifies the chemical effect of the drug, etc., or can we we call it as bhavana? It's immersing the drug in some liquid for a specific period to take out its uh, toxic effects, like that. So, uh, both the physical and the chemical impurities should be purified after collection. Then the preservation. So, some of the dravyas, like maybe fruits. They are seasonal, like if you take a amala tea, the Indian gooseberry, it is available only uh, from October to maybe early December. After that, it's not available. So we have to wait one more year for the next crop to come. So if you want to make some preparations containing amala tea, so we just can't wait till 
the next season. So for that reason, we have to preserve the dress safely by preserving its potency. After preservation, the next step comes is the preparation of various formulas like kashayas, churnas, leshyas, grutha, etc. So we should know the procedures of preparation of these various formulations. After the formulation comes the posology, it's the dosage. Once the uh, formulation is formed, once the compound is formed, next comes is the delivering the medicine to the patient. So in what dosage it should be given and also the methods of administration, how it should be given to the patient and also the times of administration. So these two, the points, the dosage and the methods and times of administration, they also uh, are repeated in the chikitsa aspect because they are more concerned with the treatment aspect. Whereas these, the first four, especially we study under the Veshija Kalpana or the preparation. So that's in general about what is Veshija, what are the Kalpas and the Veshija Kalpana, the steps involved in it. Though the Veshija we call for a Dravya, sometimes the term Veshija or Aushadi is also used in synonymous for Kalpas, for the medical preparations, for the medicinal Ayurvedic preparations, we also use the term Beshaja. So it's used synonymously for Dravyas and also for the Kalpas. So we go back to the previous slide. The properties of ideal Beshaja. Which drug we can say it as a best drug or the ideal drug? This sutra is taken from uh, Charaka Siddhisthana, 6th chapter, 15th sutra, and it says, Alpa matram mahavegam bahudoshaharam sukam lagupakam sukaswadam prinanam vyadinashanam avikaricha vyapatav na ati mlanakaram cha yat ghandavarna rasopetam vidyat matravat aushadham. So it says that a particular beshija or a particular medicine is said to be ideal if it needs to be administered in a very small quantity, if it acts very rapidly, cures most of the illnesses or diseases, one which is pleasing to one's mind, having good taste, smell, color, etc., and the one which is easily accepted by the body and digested by the body. So the medicine, the Beshaja, which is having all these properties is considered to be the ideal medicine. Okay. Now we are coming to the important topic, the today's topic, the posology or the Beshaja Matra, or in general we can call it as a dosage. The quantity or the dose of medicine administered is of great importance. The medicine administered in quantities lower than required dose does not cure the disease. On the other hand, the medicines administered in excessive quantities will result in overdose and affect the person adversely. I think this concept, the con it, it's very simple and everybody knows it. If it's given in a lesser amount, it doesn't act. And if it's go given in an overdose, it might cause the adverse effect. It looks very simple, but it is at the same time, it is looks simple, but at the same time, it is tricky. And uh, one more thing, I think the quantity, it is not only important in medicinal field, but whatever we take, in other fields also, the quantity plays an important role. Just let me give an example of cooking. So while we are cooking, if we are putting the uh, any ingredient in a very, very less quantity, so that will not give the desired flavor or taste, whatever, for it is used. On the other hand, if you used a large quantity of an ingredient in cooking, so it might overpower the flavor or it might um, change the taste of the dish. Or if you take an example, similarly in the makeup. So 
if we put on a less makeup that doesn't show off. On the other hand, if we put too much makeup, it will destroy the beauty. So the amount used is very, very important to achieve the desired result. The same thing applies in the medicine field also. So uh, the right effect of the herbs depends on the correct dosage. So if we select a correct dosage, the medicine will act with its maximum potency. Hence, an experienced Vaidya should decide the appropriate dose of the Bheshija for an individual. So by saying that, how do we decide the dose for an individual? As all of we know, Ayurveda, uh, in Ayurveda, the treatment is customized. We treat individual, not in a group. So we say, don't say that this is good for all these values, this is good for all this. We take a person, we analyze the prakriti, vikriti, how much is the body weight factored in the dosage dissemination. Yeah, here. The body weight, it's also a part. In the next slide, we are going to uh, see the criteria, which are all we have to consider in the uh, in determining the dosage suitable for a particular individual. So uh, as I'm talking, the Ayurveda mainly believes on the customized medicine or the customized treatment. So for each and every person, it is different. So we have to see or look into the following criteria to decide the dose of Ayurvedic formulations for, for a particular person. First thing is the dosha, agni, bhala, vaya, dravya, and kosta. So we have to look into all these factors. So dosha, by uh, dosha, it's vata, it may be vata, pitta, or kapha, but by dosha, here I specifically mean the extent of imbalance of dosha. So for example, if vata in one person, he comes with so and so complaint, and when you analyze his vikriti, you find it that it's vata vikriti, so vata imbalance. So if vata is mildly imbalanced in that person, and if we give a very higher dose of medicine to bring back that vata to the normalcy, so it might not act properly, it might cause some imbalances. On the other hand, in some other person where vata is severely imbalanced, so we call it as mild, moderate, and severe if we are grading it like that. In a person whose vata is severely imbalanced, if we are giving very less dose of formulation, so it's not going to work. So. That's what I mean by dosha here, the extent of dosha imbalance. That we calculate by uh, knowing the vikriti. So when we are doing the vikriti, we give points, isn't it? When we fill the vikriti forms. So by that, by looking into the patient's condition, we have to decide whether the dosha is mildly, moderately, or severely imbalanced. And based on that, we have to decide the dosha. Next is the agni. The Agni can be Mandagni or Tishagni or some person. Very rarely, when the patient is in an imbalanced state, it's rare, it's rare to have a Samadhi condition. So most of the time, either they will be in the Mandagni condition or in the Tishagni condition. So what happens here? If the person is in the Mandagni condition, in such a person, if we decide to give a large dose of medicine, that person cannot digest the medicine itself, and that medicine won't give the proper results. On the other hand, if the person is having Tikshnagni and we are giving him a small dose of the medicine, the Tikshnagni, the high digestive fire, will burn the medicine itself and that medicine won't act either. So if the person is having Mandagni, we have to decide to give him a little lower dose. On the other hand, if the person is having the Tikshnagni, we can decide to give him a little more dose so that the body can have something to use from the, that. The next is the bala. By bala, we mean the strength. It is of two types, the roga bala and the rogi bala. Roga bala is the strength of the disease, how strong the disease is. So as I, we were talking about the dosha here, we are uh, similarly here in the 
contest of roga we are talking whether the disease is mild moderate or severe if the disease is severe we might have to give a little more dose of the medicine to uh, control the uh, illness or if it's mild we might have to give the small doses similarly the rogabala rogabala is the strength of the person it's the strength of the patient so here we are not only considering the body weight so in modern medicine most probably they rely on the body weight and most of the uh, doses are described as this much mg per body weight or this much uh, this per body weight so they describe in that way per here in ayurveda we treat the both mind and body together so here rogi bala we are considering both the physical and the mental strength of the person some person might be having a well built but mentally he is very weak he is having low sattva like that or mentally he is not um, accepting the medicine something like that for such person if we are giving a large doses of medicine then it won't act so here rogi we are considering both the uh, mental state of the person and the physical state of the person not only the body weight we are considering here so after that the vaya this is a common thing we consider why both in a modern and ayurvedic medicine the age of the person so the those told for the adults it cannot be given for the children because of their small body stature the uh, dhatus the amount of the dhatus will be very less in them because of that reason so the dose should be de- Uh, decided according to the vaya or the age of the person too this is the dravya this is the ingredient used in the preparation so some preparation some formulation if it has very strong the potent drugs then that formulation might be given in a smaller dose if some of the formulations doesn't contain much teach nor the strong or the very uh, potent uh, strong medicines of uh, dravyas then that can be given in a little higher dose so that is why we are looking into the dravya or the ingredient used in various formulations the next one is the kosha we also have to consider about the kosha of the person to whom we are administering the medicine the person can have mrudu kosha madhya kosha or krura kosha so what is the significance of considering the kosha here Can anybody give some example? So what happens if the cost is why we have to consider the cost of while deciding the doses? So suppose fluid, we know it's a purgative or a laxative. So if some formulation. is containing the thrivrat and if we are giving it to a mrudu kosha person and if we are giving it to a giving in a large dose what will happen the person will start um, purging very severely so then it might not be able to control he might go for dehydration so and so so depending on the kosha we have to decide whether if it's containing some of the dravyas like thrivrat etc we should know that we have to give in a small dose for a person who is having mrudu kosha for example for a krura kosha these persons are mostly constipated so for them if we are planning to give some laxatives or purgatives if we are giving it in a short dose that doesn't act at all so for them we have to give it in a little larger dose than the usual or the suggested dose so that is why also we have to consider the cost of a person so in the next coming slides we are looking into the general doses uh, told by ayurvedic scholars for various formulations after considering that while treating or while uh, prescribing some medicines we have to consider all these factors the dosha agni bala vayas dravya or the ingredients of the preparation and the cost of a person after analyzing all these we have to fix the dosage suitable for that particular person 
these are the general guidelines, the Ayurvedic text, what they say for the doses of various formulations. The Swarasa, Kalka, Kashaya, the Hima, and Fanta. These five are considered as the basic kalpanas, the pradhana kalpana they are called. So all other formulations, it can be uh, Gulika, that's a tablet, the jam preparations, the asavas, aristas, even the ghee preparations, etc. They are considered as the sub-formulations, the upakalpanas of these five. So the basically five formulations and the all other are derived from these five. So the swaraza is the expressed juice and it should be given in a half pala. These are all the uh, direct terms from the Ayurvedic text. In olden days, they were using a different um, uh, dosage system or the uh, mana, what they call it, what you can say, mm, the measurements. So they were using a different system of measurements, like uh, starting from LO mustard, they take it as LO mustard, then three LO mustard is equal to one black gram, three black gram is equal to so and so. They take the example of grains and they come to a higher, higher versions. So when we convert it into a metric conversion, half pala comes to be around 24 ml. So if you are administering the swarasa, show the maximum dose we can give is around 24 ml and that is per day in divided doses. So for 24 hours, we can give the amount of 24 ml. If you are giving it two times, then we can divide into 12 and 12 ml. And if you are giving it in three times, we can divide it by three and make the dose. The kalka, the paste preparation, the dose is said to be one karsha or the 12 grams per whole day. The kashaya, the um, dose for the decoctions, one pala, that's approximately 48 ml. For the cold infusion, again, the dose is one pala, that's 48 ml. And for the hot infusion, it is one to two pala, 48 to 96 ml. Um, the swarasa, kalka, kashaya, these are progressively less potent and they are progressively light to digest. The swarasa is the heaviest. The kalka is the second heaviest. The kashaya is a little more lighter than the kalka. The hima is still lighter, and the fanta is the lightest to digest. That is why they say the swarasa should not be given not more than 24 ml because it's heavy. It's a very potent. It's a very concentrated that expressed juice of a uh, herb or a plant. Whereas the fanta, it is very light. It's a uh, what we do in the font is just like preparing the coffee. Put some herbs and put boiling water on it. Keep it closed for a few hours, then um, strain it and get the liquid. So the amount of medicinal properties transferred to the liquid is less here in case of fanta when compared to the swarasa. There we are um, making a paste of the fresh herbs and we are squeezing the concentrated juice out of it. That is why they say a little lesser dose of the swarasa and a little more dose for the fanta. And again, these doses are for the moderate built persons. So if you are giving it in a person uh, who is having a low amount of dosha imbalance, who is having a less agni or who is having uh, less bala or the strength, again, we have to decide and we have to give a little lesser than this dosage. Or if the person is strong, if the disease is very strong or if the doshas are severely imbalanced, etc., we can give a little more than this dose. So this is just the general guideline what we can follow, but we have to decide whether to give the same dose or to give a little less or a little more depending on the patient's condition and also the drug we are used in it. For example, it says the uh, paste, the Kalkamadra is 12 grams, but if we are giving the paste of some Tikshna Dravyas like uh, 
garlic so it's very strong so we cannot give it in the same dose as told in the classic text we have to reduce the dose because the garlic is very very tishna and strong so that is how why we have to uh, decide the dose by using our intelligence these are the dose for various uh, upakalpanas or the sub formulations like churna if you are administering a churna the powder the matra is one karsha or it's approximately 12 grams the, for jam preparations the dose is 2 to 4 karshas that is 24 to 48 grams for ghee preparations it's half to one pala 24 to 48 grams for pills is one karsha that's 12 grams all these are per day dosages so we have to give in a divided doses either twice daily or three times daily or once daily so asava and asava that's a fermented herbal mix it its dosage is one pala or 48 grams and the arista that's a herbal wine its dosage is also one pala in the or the 48 grams approximately. So next we'll consider the dosage for children. Sharangadara has mentioned that the dose for newborn infant should be extremely small. The dose for one old one month old baby should be as low as one rati. So again they start from the very minute particle calling as Trisareno, there's a dust, minute dust particle as one standard mana and they go on increasing three Trisarenos, six Trisarenos, etc. and they reach to a dose called one rati and uh, when we convert it into the metric conversion, so it comes approximately 120 uh, mg's. So after that, after one month, the dose should be increased by one rati every month up to one year when the total dose will become 12 ratis, that's approximately 1.4 grams. Here, while uh, explaining the dosage for children, he didn't go by the formulations like uh, asavas, aristas, like that. Just in general, he says we had to restrict the medicine in the for one rati when the baby is one month old. Then we had to increase one rati. So if the baby is two months old, then we can give up to two ratis of the medicine. If the baby is six months old, we can give up to six ratis of the medicine like that. So when the baby will be one year approximately, 1.4 grams of the medicine can be given. And uh, from one year, one to four years, the dosage should be between half to one masha. One masha is considered approximately three grams and half that becomes 1.5 so it should be between 1.5 to 3 grams and after that the dosage should be decided by considering the bala agni etc and uh, it says maybe from 4 to 10 years it can be between 2 to 3 marshas and from uh, 10 to 14 years it can be from three to four marshas that comes to be around the adult dose. Four marshas is equal to one karsha. That's nothing but the 12 grams, the standard dose. So that's how we have to calculate for the children. Yeah, here is a question by Rich. Would that also be for a premature children? No, it, it cannot be considered for a premature children because that's where the intelligence of a person comes. So it's for a normal full-term baby they say it's pandrati so obviously the premature baby will be very weak than the term full-term baby so for them it should be given in a little more lesser dose like maybe can go for 80 mg or 60 mg like that so after that when the baby improves its physical condition when and it catches up with its growth chart then we can come to the regular dose told by the scholars Next is the special considerations. So these are the general guidelines previously told. Other than that, some special type of doses are told in Ayurveda. 
especially in the case of Prasayana Chikisa, a gradually increasing dose is given for the first four days and then the dose is gradually decreased for the last three days in a course of seven days treatment. If they are giving a 10 days of treatment, then the first six days, the dose is gradually increased from seventh day to 10th day, the dose is gradually decreased. So usually this Vardhamana Rasayana uh, dose is told for the Pipali, that's for a long, long pepper. So they call it as So for long pepper, the Vardham Pipali, they use this special dosage of gradually increasing and tapering, and that type of dosage is called Vardhamana Rasayana. Suppose we are starting with one, or uh, for the first day, we are, for first day, we are starting with three people is then on the second day we are increasing it to six for third day we are increasing it to nine for fourth day we are increasing it to 12 from fifth day we are gradually decreasing it to nine sixth day we are coming back to six and on the seventh day, we'll hit the baseline where we started, that is three. So we should start from one particular dose, gradually increase the dose for a regular time, and after that, we have to gradually taper it. They say that by doing it, the body will get the most benefits of the Rasayana Dravyas. That is why, especially for the Pipali Rasayana, they have mentioned this, Vardhamana Rasayana dosage. Similarly, in case of Purva Karma, that's a pre procedure, done in case of Pancha Karma, one more special type of dosage is told that is called as a Arohana Sneha. So we give Sneha Pana for first seven days. We give the Grata to the person as a preparatory procedure for Pancha Karma for seven days. After that, the Pradhana Karma, that either the emesis or the purgation or the basti is performed on the eighth day and followed by that for seven days, the post procedure is done, which is also called as Samsarjana Karma. So, in this, uh, when we are administering the Gratha or the um, Ghee for Purva Karma as a part of Pancha Karma, so we are following the Arohana Sneha. Here Arohana again means the ascending. So we'll start from the lowest dose that patient can digest. So initially we'll improve his Agni by giving some uh, uh, Deepana, Pachana, Dravyas like Trikachu, uh, Lavana, Hingu, etc. Then we start from the lowest dose of the Sneha. This is uh, the lowest dose of the ghee he can digest. Then we gradually increase the dose of ghee each day till fourth day, then from fifth day again we'll come back. What happens here by following the ascending dosage is the person will digest the sneha given by a oral root and each that sneha will penetrate into the each and every cell and the throats of the body and the all throats and whole entire body will be coated with the sneha and will be well lubricated. So on the other hand, if you give a very high dose of uh, ghee on a first day itself, the patient's agni might not digest it and they just will be thrown out in the form of feces. So it's of no use, it's not going to help. That is why to make the agni to accustomed to digest this gratha, so we are gradually increasing it and we are making that um, grata to be available to the dhatus and srotases. So that is the reason they told the arohana sneha. So these two are just a special type of dosages are told in Ayurveda. One is the vardhamana rasayana and another is the 
ಆರೋಹಣ ಸ್ನೇಹ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಪ್ರೀ ಪ್ರೊಸೀಜರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಪಂಚಕರ್ಮ ಸೊ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಮೂವಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ಟು ದ ಅನದರ್ ಕಾನ್ಸೆಪ್ಟ್ ದಿಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಭೇಷ ಜಾಲ ದ ಟೈಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಡ್ಮಿನಿಸ್ಟ್ರೇಷನ್ ಆಯುರ್ವೇದ ಬಿಲೀವ್ ದಟ್ ದ ಟೈಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಡ್ಮಿನಿಸ್ಟ್ರೇಷನ್ of our it also has an important role in obtaining the desired results so there are 11 beshaja khalas described in ayurveda especially related with the day and night cycle and the food cycle they are on the empty stomach they call it as ananda without having any food anna is the food so without having any food that's usually the early morning it is said that the dravya will have its strongest if impact on an empty stomach especially uh, it's indicated when there is excessive kapha in the throat region but we should take care that if the patient is having very low strength and if the patient's sattva is low who cannot withstand the medicine for such persons uh, the medicine cannot be administered in a empty stomach only if the patient is very strong and if he can withstand the effect of the medicine then the medicine can be given in a empty stomach or the early morning time the next time is before meals it is useful in case of the apanavata vikrati and it also helps to strengthens the agni the third one is during the meals so along with the meals so especially it's indicated in case of the samanavata vikrati and vishamagni we know that the samanavata it resides in the kosta it resides in the belly and it helps the pachaka pitta to digest the food so in case of the imbalance of samana vata and also in case of the diseases of the agni the medicine can be given during the meals then is the after meals so after meals the uh, medicine is given especially in case of the piana vata disorders that the vana vata is imbalanced and also the kapha pacifying and drying and eating herbs can be given to help the digestion after meals so next call is mixed with the food so this uh vesha jakala is specially practiced for to suppress the bad taste of the food and also in case of children and delicate persons or per- persons who are having aversion for the food who are not who are reluctant to take the medicine for them it is best to mix the medicine with the food and give it to them the next basic kala is both before and after the food it's it is useful for treating the diseases like convulsions trembling or the diseases of the lower part of the body the next call is between two meals that's best for treating the disorders of vyana vata the outward moving air that governs the circulation the next is the dose of the administration with the each morsel of food they call it as grasa with each morsel of food the medicine is taken this uh time is used to stimulate the digestion and for taking the aphrodisiac medicines next is the between the bites of the food between the two morsels so this is useful for treating the disorders disorders of the pranavata the next time is muhur muhur that is taking the medicine repeatedly this is suggested for treating the diseases like cough hiccup dyspnea omitting poisoning etc so in these cases we just cannot stick to giving the medicine once in the morning or is it just before the food or after the food so whenever the person gets cough we have to give the small doses of the medicine repeatedly in also in case of hiccups and even poisoning etc so giving small doses repeatedly is useful in all these cases the next basic call is at night or the bed time it is useful for treating the diseases of head neck ear nose throat and ear neck and throat so these are the 11 basic khalas the time of administration for the medicine so depending on the dosha involved we have to select and also the certain conditions like 
cough, hiccup, etc. So we have to decide which time is best to administer the formulation. So to conclude today's lecture, the dose is one of the important factors which determines the efficacy of a herb or a formulation. General guidelines are given in Ayurvedic text regarding the doses of each formulation. But while delivering the herb or formulations, an intelligent practitioner should decide the appropriate dose for that particular person by considering factors like agni, dosha, strength of a person, disease, age, etc., what we already discussed. And also, the importance should be given to Beshi Jakhala or the time of administration of medicine to achieve the best results. Here are some assignments. Uh, it's a, please fill in the blanks using the textbooks as a source. And um, Dr. Monica, you, do you want me to read the assignment for them? or? Thank you, Sana. I can take okay. it over from here. Just um, OK. Thank, thank you thank so you. much. That was a wonderful presentation. So uh, there's a lot of assignments, like I said in the uh, last class, for Dravya particularly, because it's not something we can tell you to do and you learn it. The only way you do it is you, know, you get your hands dirty. So we're going to be asking you to prepare things like chulnams. So last class, I had, uh, uh, we had asked you to prepare a jam. Going forward, we'd ask you to prepare chulnam. And you've already prepared ghee, gritams. So you've already prepared kashaya in the Ayurvedic nutrition class. So. There's a lot of assignments for Dravya, and there's a Dravya quiz at the end. Um, so this is assignment 2D. We give you an example of herbs. For example, exam uh, let me just take this back. Okay. Uh, we've given you some herbs like Gugulu, Ashwagandha, Brahmi, Jatamamsi, Sesame, Sweet Sour Salt, Pitta Guruji, uh, there's just certain herbs that, that are given. And then you have to fill in the blanks, uh, herbs suitable for A, B, or C. I think Stacy's already done this uh, assignment. Uh, everybody else who hasn't done it, please do it. And then you have the assignment churnam. So this is a pretty good one, because last time, uh, so everybody knows how to make a kashaya. Everybody knows how to make an infusion. They know how to make a fanta. The infusion is fanta, then kashai, we already did this in the Ayurvedic nutrition. Uh, everybody made a ghee or a gritam. And then the last week, people have been uploading their jams. And till now, I think uh, Christy is winning our jam competition. Still waiting for someone to knock her off that. But everybody does a fantastic job. Uh, so the next assignment is you prepare a dry chunam. So you just basically take uh, different herbs and you mix them together to make a dry chunam. It has to be, so once you've given you certain herbs, your vata herbs, spice mix, cinnamon, nutmeg, shatavari, or you can use your own herbs, no problem, as long as the effect of the herb is it's rasa increasing spices with warming video for yourself or for a mythical medical student XYZ who's fatigued. And then um, write a few combination of herb and spice or sweet mix which have this, this, this. Or so it's you can mix, a, you can do a dry chunam for a vata person, pitta person, or a kapha mom. I think we, we talked about this assignment last time. So it's up to you. Choose one person making a dry chunam for. You can use spices and herbs together. And once you make it, uh, take a picture. Put in your recipe, put it in a PDF, and please let us know, uh, you know, what you did with it, and then we'll actually want to discuss it in the forum, because uh, we we want to talk about what anupan and what dosages, and that we will do in the forum. Uh, so please do your true num assignment next time, and uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, please uh, put it in the forums for Dr. Sahana. Thank you very much. Sahana, that was a fantastic class. As always, thank you very much.